had a question about why is that I don't wire off immediately after throwing. And I've touched on this in previous videos, but I'm going to go over why I don't wire off and when I do wire off and the reasons behind it. So this is a piece I threw yesterday. And my general workflow, the way pieces go through the studio, is that I throw them one day and then I leave them to dry on the bats. This is a Hartley and Noble uh, Russian doll bat system. I let them dry on the bats um, overnight, uh, relatively uh, enclosed. So I used to do it when I had my larger bats and I was using these ones, which I still use for darker clay. Um, I would use upturned, these, my glaze ingredients come in these buckets. So I just leave the bucket over it like that. It lets it, the moisture content even out and dry out a bit without completely drying out. Now what I do is I've got uh, like a kind of covered-y thing. Actually, it's roller shelves that I've wrapped in plastic, so I can seal off a big um, unit of them and I can throw them kind of like 20, 30 pieces and put them all in there. But the idea is to dry them to the soft side of leather hard, still on the back. And the reason for that is that... Um, I'm going to show you... Uh, the downside to doing this is that the bats swell slightly, so they're a bit... But you kind of see in at the bottom, it's got... I don't know if you'll be able to see it, but basically the clay isn't particularly smooth because it's got the, um, the throwing marks still in it. But it's the perfect dryness now to remove them um, and have everything smooth. So what I do at this point is I compress the base slightly and put a swirl in by just pushing down and moving your finger out, which I mean, you've done plates and you put a swirl in them. It's that basic process, but I do that the inside bottom of everything just because you either can't see anything on the base, um, in which case fine, or you will see the irregularities. So what you want is an irregularity that's a pattern that looks good rather than being like you accidentally left a high point in the middle and that will be obvious and it doesn't, it doesn't look as good. So, put a swirl in the bottom, then I burnish with just fingertips the wall of the piece, if it's a swirly piece, and I'll show you what I do with a straight side one in a second. Um, then, with a trimming tool, and this is why it's really useful, because you could do that part later. But this is something you can't do well at any other point. I trim the rim down just a fraction. But so you get the stability when throwing of a fatter rim. And now it's approaching leather hard. I can take a small amount of clay off and get the rim as thin as I want it which is a couple of mil I found to be the nicest to drink from. Um, and then this is the best bit, is that with a bit of plastic, this is just a strip of the um, bag my clay comes in, you can burnish the rim. And that's now almost shiny from being burnished, which means it's perfectly smooth. And because this clay is not very grogged, it will stay that way. So you end up with a lip with no sharp bits, but quite tight radius. And it's um, the most comfortable lip to drink from that I found. And you can reliably make them this way. If you try and do that um, on a thrown one, it's harder to get it exactly how you want it. And then you can wire off and they are now um, the perfect dryness to pick up without distorting. So I mean, you still need to be a little bit careful, don't stress the clay, but it will stay round and I can show you the inside is just that bit smoother. Oh, there's some, you do get debris from uh, the trimming in there, but the good thing is once this is fully dry, you can just knock it out. So before you load it into a bisque firing, just make sure you knock those bits out. They're not actually stuck, they're just loose in there. Then what I do is I've got my old bats which don't fit on this wheel head because the wheel head's so much bigger, but I'll just let them dry 
on that and I will put six or so of them on there and then I've got these plastic boxes from Ikea the Ikea ones are particularly nice because most of them have um, something to strengthen the bottom but most plastic boxes just have ridges that come in the Ikea ones have got this um, structure underneath that the base is perfectly smooth so you can stack pieces in it and then it's your choice of either putting the lid on properly which completely seals it so they'll dry a fraction and then they can't dry any more than that because all the moisture is trapped inside or put the lid on upside down and there's a very small air gap um, which means that they will dry slowly. Some of the air gets replaced every kind of time period, but for the most part the humidity will even out and the pieces will dry slowly. So that's very useful for mugs because you don't want them to dry unevenly, so you want them in a sealed box where the humidity will even out and everything will dry slowly together. Plastic boxes are great for that. And then um, this will be an impulse mug, so this is basically the same process but slightly different. Also, if you're using um, these type of, um, I've sanded that just a fraction um, and it helps to get rid of any clay dust and also if it's wet it will slide in ever so slightly easier, so that does go in a little bit better. Right, so for straight sided pieces, you actually have a bit more control than you do with swirly ones because you can't trim a swirly one down once you've done it. But this is where, if this was a travel mug, what I'd do is I'd trim a notch in there so that the lid's got something to grip onto. But it's just a regular impulse mug. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to shape the rim the way I want it, which again is just a light trim, and I'll burnish that in a second. But what you can do, and this is particularly good if you throw it on the thicker side, is you can just take a bit out of the walls. And actually, um, I've done this in the wrong order, it's better to do the walls before you do the rim, because now all the debris from trimmings in there and I don't really want to feel the thickness of the walls because if I knock any of them into it they'll stick. Um, if there's nothing on the inside you can trim like that and you will feel how thick the wall is as you go. Um, and it just lets you make sure that the wall is as thin as it can possibly be. Well, as thin as you want it. So obviously the thinner the walls, the lighter the mug, um, the better in one regard, but it obviously means it's more breakable. So it's entirely up to you how thin you make them, but it's nice being able to just take a little bit off and then green mud tools rib, burnish back. So that is now Very smooth on the outside. The rim how you want it. And then draw the line. This is got one sharp of the line out. Of course I picked that one. Draw the line for the impulse dots with a sharpie or a permanent marker of some description because it will burn off in the firing. Um, and you won't see it. So that's how I would do an impulse mug. And again, if that is dry enough to pick up and tip those bits out. And then what I'll do is I'll do a batch of them, they'll all go into storage, and then the next day, I've actually got a set dry at the moment, I Prepare a batch of handles and then the day is spent with um, the pieces out alongside the handles 
and I just make sure that they're drying or they're going to be at the right dryness together. Um, if one of them's drying too quick, that can go back into a plastic box. Um, as it is, these are looking like they're probably 10 20 minutes away from being trimmable. So, what I might do is trim them in a minute and then Depending on where the handles are at, these will go back in the plastic for half an hour or so, and then I'll attach the handles. There's a previous video on attaching handles, which I'll put in the comments as well. Um, but yeah, I might film the trimming of them, I might not. I can't remember what I filmed last time. But yeah, trimmed and handled later. It's basically a three day process, or over three days. So the first day you throw, let them even up to the point of being able to trim like this. Um, and this will be a peacock eye, um, peacock eye cup, but the process is basically identical. Um, you, the, the goal with all of this is to get things to the level of dryness that you want them at for each specific process. And if you're in a shared studio and it's not an option to do these sorts of timings, it's not the end of the world. But if you're in your own studio and can specify exactly when you want to do stuff, then this is the way that I found works best for me. Um, and this has the advantage, it's back to me being a very kind of short batch. I don't, I, th I throw to order, so as an order comes in, I'll quite often throw that piece then, um, which means that I don't need the economy of scale of throwing 100 things next day, trimming 100 things. I can have something going on at every stage, so as I was saying, those are ready for handles. That's the work that I threw two days ago. This stuff is going to be have its initial trim and then be put in a box, and then in a minute I'm going to throw some more stuff. So I kind of keep everything going along together. Um, which works really well in a small studio with a small kiln. If you've got a big studio, big kiln, or you work in a shared space um, and you're not there all the time, you'll have to come up with a slightly different approach to it. Uh, but that is where something like um, damp boxes are great. Which is what you do for that is you take the um, IKEA box and you'd pour plaster in. And the plaster in the base uh, retains moisture so you basically it's like having a plastic box but rather than trying to control the humidity that's put in there by the pieces you actually just specify the humidity so you pour some water onto the plaster that plaster will now keep it all the work in there damp you can actually rehydrate pieces so if a piece has got too dry and you put it in uh, a damp box that's saturated over time the humidity will transfer back into the clay and you can actually um, soften things up so they're very useful i haven't actually bothered making any because i don't generally need them for my process because i'm in the studio all the time but as i say if you're in a shared studio um, and you can't specify exactly the timings in the way that you can if you're in the studio every single day um, and it's your studio. Uh, that's the sort of time where having a plastic box um, that's capable of... Uh, a proper damp box can keep things in a workable state for months or years depending on how well it seals. So you could throw some pieces if you were, your work involves carving, you can get it to the the point where you would carve the clay and you can keep it in that level of dryness for months if you particularly wanted. Um, it doesn't matter quite so much for my pieces. The only ones it really matters for at all are these, the peacock eye and pebble, where you've got to get the dryness right for stamping the pattern. Um, but what you can do, so long as you don't have any debris in the inside, like I've just added there, is you've got to get that out first. But if you get one of those water spray bottles, 
you can spray the inside um, with just a misting of water and then let it soak in and a misting of water and let it soak in and do that a couple of times um, and it will make clay that's too dry to stamp it will bring the inside of the piece uh, up to a level of humidity and dampness and plasticity that you can stamp perfectly and actually you get a really good quality of stamp if you let the clay dry too much and then bring just the inside of the piece back you get a better quality of stamp in a lot of ways the only thing with it is that it's a, a bit more time consuming it's a bit more effort and it's a bit higher risk than just stamping at the right dryness which Timing wise, as I say, these were thrown yesterday, they've been left overnight, I'll get them off here. Um, I sit them on the wood upside down, which lets the base dry and the inside doesn't dry that much. And in about an hour, these will probably be ready to stamp. So you're, you want the softer side of leather hard, but firm enough that the, the whatever you're stamping with doesn't stick, which is a, a good indication if it's too soft. If it's sticking and you, when you pull it off, the clay is trying to come with it and it's, the outside is too wet. Um, if you get the drying completely wrong, the inside can be too dry and the outside can be too wet, which obviously means that it's not going to work well in it, on either side. Generally, one of them will be too something and the other will be right. Um, with a misting bottle, you can get them both right at the same time. Uh, or just make sure you get to them before they're too dry and dry them upside down like that and then um, you end up with the outside drier than the inside which is what you're aiming for. And I think that is a fairly exhaustive list of um, things to say about this. So that's it, that's my workflow uh, and that's how kind of pieces progress through. And then I just dry them for a few more days after that, um, and then they get bisqueed. So, sort of a, an ongoing process, but you can keep it going seven days a week if you wanted to, and churn out a decent amount of work without ever having to throw a hundred pieces a day. Or, you know, you don't spend a day doing any one process. You do a bit of everything every day. Um, yeah, I'll add anything to the comments. That I said I was going to or if I think of any other points I'll add them but otherwise I think that's it